in addition, this year we have, we're joined by uh, the provost fellows uh, who are uh, coming from all the departments in the university and their main focus, uh, computing is a big part of their research work. So the idea here is for the fellows uh, to meet each other, exchange ideas and create a community. Um, the uh, iDisc has been sponsoring the, uh, the fellows program for more than 15 years now. And the idea is to uh, foster and encourage interdisciplinary research across the university and across departments uh, and allow people to exchange ideas essentially make breakthrough in disciplinary sciences, as well maybe in algorithmic developments for tackling new problems. So uh, we have, I'm gonna let the fellows introduce themselves a little bit about their group background, their the motivation for their project, what it is, and uh, we'll, uh, they, they have a very short time because we have about 10 presentations going. What you will notice is that they're coming from all campuses across the universities, engineering, arts and science, uh, marine science, medical, et cetera. So uh, without further ado, we'll start with our first uh, iDisc fellow, uh, Christian Ramsumer. Hello everybody, good afternoon. So my name um, is Christian Ramsumir, um, and I'm an MD PhD student uh, currently working currently working um, in the Shaw Lab. Um, and today, and today, um, I'll be discussing. Uh, yep. Um, and today, I'll be discussing uh, the role of um, transposable elements um, in glioblastoma. Um, and just in case, um, if anybody here. Um, um, is it familiar? Glioblastoma, um, or GBM, um, um, is a grade four, um, is a grade four glioma, which is a type um, of, um, of brain tumor. So before I go into um, my, um, my, um, my motivation for for the IDSC project, um, I just wanted to provide um a quick um like a quick like a um like a quick primer um on what um on what um a cancer stem cell is. So a cancer stem cell is a is a type of cell within a tumor, um, which um, which is vital which is vital for the self renewal aspect um, of the tumor, um, as well as um, as well as for uh, propagation of the tumor. So essentially, uh, without that, uh, uh, without uh, without without uh, this population um, of cells, uh, the tumor actually would not be able uh, to propagate uh, within itself. Um, um, similar to that, um, of a wild type stem cell, cancer stem cells are allowed uh, to self renew, um, as well to um, as well as uh, to differentiate. So a lot of studies, um, like I tried, are uh, to characterize cancer stem cells, um, in terms of um, like in terms of factors uh, that make them, uh, that make them are uh, unique uh, to both the wild type stem cell, um, as well as to the to, uh, um, as well as to the differentiated type um, of cell, um, and these studies have included um, haven't have have included um, looking at looking at um, looking at various factors such as epigenetics or the transcription factors that allow the, the cells to be unique. But um, up one in particular aspect that the Shaw Lab is interested in um, um, is these transposable elements. Um, which are characterized um, as being um, as being um, increased um, whenever you have um, a cancer stem cell. Uh, but normally, uh, this is just um, this is this is just, um, this is just um, explained. Um, this is just explained as a consequence um, of the genome um, of cancer cells being hypomethylated. Um, um, but some studies. Um, that the Shaw lab um, has shown is that we actually have shown um, a functional role, um, uh, 
for these transports, but other men's, um, and that they actually are contribute to the stemness um, uh, of these cancer stem cells. Um, so in this paper in particular, um, Dr. Shaw looked at um, a type of transposable element known as HERV-K, uh, which is an endogenous retrovirus um, within our genome. Um, so again, normally, normally um, like in our normal cells, these endogenous retroviruses would be silenced, but in the tumor cells are the active. So I guess um, just just a very, very quickly go over the um, different mechanisms in which they, um, in which these um, endogenous retroviruses could be oncogenic. Um, we could have an endogenous retrovirus um, insert itself within a gene or within a gene that suppresses tumors, which of course I will silence it. We could have the gene um, integrate uh, integrate um, upstream of an oncogene, which would activate the oncogene. Um, um, also, um, on the coding region of these endogenous retroviruses, um, I can make different kind of proteins, um, which could activate um, different stem cell um, signaling uh, signaling pathways. So. Um, so this, so this area of research has been quite um, a hot topic um, in the past couple of years, um, and some papers have actually looked at um, have actually looked at characterizing um, are these entities um, in prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, and colon cancer. Um, and for these um, and and for these studies, they relied on a, um, they they relied on a database known as a TCGA. Um, but I think you know. One of the reasons why I believe that they chose not to look um, I'm a GBM, I'm a glioblastoma, um, and to study in, in, um, in particular is because uh, is because uh, uh, the TCGA um, as well as all the data um, as well as all the data, data um, um, as well as all the databases they they don't have a lot of normal sample um, of a brain tissue like. Like, like, um, like they might have other tissue um, of the tumor um, itself, but they don't have other uh, normal control tissue uh, to have side by side. Um, so this paper, which was published um, a couple of years ago, um, um, I was reading it and I noticed that they had, um, that they had quite a bit um, of data um, at the genetic level, um, as well as RNA-seq data, uh, which has quite a big N for, this, for the stem cell population, for the differentiated um, cancer cells, um, as well as for the wild type um, neural stem cells. So with this, um, uh, we should be able to see other uh, other uh, genes, um, other genes that are different between uh, the stem cell population, other uh, other uh, uh, the differentiated tissue in the tumor, um, as well as the wild type are control as well. Um, and just as a quick note, um, normally, normally I'm an, I'm an RNA seq data. Uh, the Herve expression, um, or basically, um, or, um, or basically, any kind of uh, transposable element um, um, expression, I'm um, that I'm um, that normally labeled uh, within that uh, uh, within uh, the data set. Uh, so we have to use different kinds of algorithms. Um, and telescope um, is one of those algorithms um, that we use uh, to visualize that. So. So just to briefly sum up, um, are, are the aims of my project are to identify uh, the differentially um, expressed uh, transposable element loci, um, as well as the retroviral um, loci uh, between, um, uh, between uh, uh, the subpopulations of a glioblastoma tumor cell, which include other uh, stem cells um, of the tumor, other uh, uh, the normal tissue, um, of the tumor, um, as well as to the wild type of controls um, um, in that patient, um, which would be um, which would be uh, the NSCs, which is the normal stem cells in the brain, um, as well as just uh, the normal tissue in the brain. Um, and next, um, using using different kinds um, of computational methods, um, once we have the loci um, of these transposable elements, we would also want to see um, if nearby genes um, I'm also I'm affected as well. Um, 
uh, because we hypothesize um, that perhaps uh, that perhaps so some of those genes, some of those genes that by this low side um, may be oncogenes or um, tumor suppressor genes. I and mean, lastly, um, any findings that we get um, with this data set that I mentioned, um, we could try to confirm our results, our data, either from uh, the TCGA or from an internal data set that we have uh, from patients here at UM as well, um, that we've already um, looked at the uh, transfer as well element um, expression as well. And in, the, um, and in the sake of time, I won't go through all my methods, but basically this is just kind of like a general work, um, like a general workflow of the techniques that I hope to use um, for this project. I'll, I'll be downloading other fast fuel files first, um, doing some quality uh, control, um, using the algorithms uh, that I've described previously uh, to quantify other transposable elements. Um, and then I'll be using R um, to do most of the clustering and visualization um, for, this, um, for this project. Thank you. Our second this fellow is Anna Golikova. She's a senior in biology, I believe, and her research revolves around corals. Uh, my name is Anna. I'm a senior. Thank you for the introduction. I'm majoring in biology, minor uh, chemistry, computer science, and psychology. And today I'll be uh, talking about my project about identif identification of bacterial viruses and two reef building coral species, Chilodiplorus trigosa and Manchesteria cavernosa. And my mentors are Dr. Cynthia Silvera from the Department of Biology and Dr. Uh, Vadapali from the ITIS. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction for my project. So we know that corals are animals and they live uh, with associations with other organisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, archaea, and other protists. Um, we don't know much about what viruses do with corals, but we, don't, we know that in other systems, virus can, for example, infect bacteria, and then we call these viruses bacteriophages. Upon infection, then my introduce various genes inside their host, and if these genes can encode for pathogenicity, then the uh, bacteria in this case will be pathogenic. This is a case of cholera disease when the toxin for uh, disease actually is encoded in a uh, virus, and then virus integrates inside the host and the gene gets expressed, the bacteria becomes pathogenic. Uh, we think that this similar pattern can be happening in other systems in coral reefs. So viruses, we hypothesize that viruses can be contributing to coral diseases, such as Kittel D, which is a stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, it's characterized by these severe lesions that you can see on a screen, um, and uh, it spreads pretty fast and it originated in Miami. Uh, so the idea is that viruses in seawater, they can integrate, uh, in, in fact, bacteria associated with corals um, cause these bacteria to become pathogenic for corals and this might result in a coral diseases. So my aim is to study these marine viruses and uh, their interactions with corals and bacteria that are associated with corals. So far uh, by working in a lab, I was able to isolate 10 putative seawater phages that in fact uh, some Vibrio uh, bacteria that were isolated from uh, corals in Miami, and um, we do it in a lab through plaque assays. Each, this is a method when you put bacteria and viruses in a close proximity to each other, and if there's infection, you can see this transparent spots. I don't know if you can see them on the screen, but these transparent spots, um, we call them plaques, and one plaque is one infection, so watch one virus, and you can isolate this virus. I isolate viruses, I'm extracting their DNA right now and sending them for sequencing their genomes. And after that, I'm planning on doing a bioinformatic analysis in order to get genome annotation and also conduct comparative genomic study. So after I get my genome sequence, I'll have raw DNA reads, which I'll then put through different software. So for through BBDAC to do quality control and obtain clean DNA reads, which are then can be um, run through speech to assemble context or maybe even whole genomes. If our uh, samples have little contamination, then these genomes can be annotated with Vibrant and to get individual genes and know what is the composition of the genome. And in the case of phages, some of these annotation genes, they might be 
they might encode virulence factors or auxiliary metabolic genes. That are the genes that are encoded in phage, in phage but are expressed in a bacteria in a host. And um, they might uh, convert bacteria to become pathogenic. So we can align this against the genomes of host and uh, see if phages can contribute these functions to, to bacteria. Uh, in case of host and the bacteria, some of the genes can encode for CRISPR spacers. And uh, those can give us some idea of whether bacteria can have some historical infection um, being made by these phages or whether they might have some resistant mechanisms against the viruses. And uh, also there are a lot of, we have metagenomic, metagenomes uh, available from public databases uh, such as NCBI and from Silvera lab. So we can also um, align the genomes that are obtained from bacteria and from viruses against this metagenomes um, and uh, see, look at the abundance. So with this bioinformatic approach, I'll be able to look at the genomic composition and taxonomy of my isolated viruses, look at the abundance of uh, isolated phages and their bacterial hosts in coral reefs and Florida and the Caribbean. So this will be done through metagenomics. Uh, also to look at differences and abundances of viruses that encode uh, virulence genes and uh, to look at the differences between healthy and sick corals, also through metagenomics. And overall, it will shed some light on the contribution of bacteria viruses to emergence of pathogens in coral reefs. And with that, I'd like to thank members of Silvera Lab, my research mentor, Dr. Cynthia Silvera, Beyond the Book Scholar, <laughs> Summer Research Scholarship that funding my work, and the uh, IDISC Steering Committee and my mentor, Dr. Uh, Vada Fali. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Madeline Dawson is a PhD student in ocean sciences and is interested in remote sensing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, I am a, currently a PhD student in the ocean science department at the Rasmus campus. So my advisor is Dr. Hans Graver. And my project is titled Island Wake Segmentation and Characterization from Synthetic Aperture Radar Imagery, a Deep Learning Approach. So as I go through this presentation, of course, it's just going to be a high level um, understanding of it because there's a lot to um, the data sets and also the phenomenon that I'm studying. But the a specific phenomenon I'm looking at is island wake parameterization. Um, so island wakes are typically wind generated phenomenon. Um, they are all, all are also specifically current, but I'm focusing on wind generated phenomenon that are created when the wind passes over a high uh, terrain of island of an island. So specifically, this is a Sentinel-1 Sentinel imagery over the Caribbean islands that was taken April 25th, um, 2022, from actually a space-borne satellite that orbits around 700 kilometer, kilometers above, above the Earth. And so usually these wake these wakes that are seen in these images, they're shown to align with the prevailing wind directions, which in this case is the easterly winds. And these, we're able to see these within the SAR image, not through this image exactly, because this is a false um, color representation, but what we're able to do is we're able to look at how the backscatter, um, specifically that the satellite active system sends out, um, which translates into the surface roughness changes that you see here in this image, which where the dark regions are, that's going to be the island wake signature. And that's going to mean that there's going to be a low velocity um, behind the leeward side where the wind is blowing towards it. So the motivation of how I'm going to parameterize my island wakes are through power laws. So I'm making a um, assumption that this is going to be a self-similar turbulent flow that I'm going to be at first looking at in classical cases. Um, so I'm going to be looking at a velocity scale and a width scale. So if you see on on the right, you can see the island region or maybe a specific rigid body, which in my case is an island, and there'll be a, an incoming uh, velocity and it will produce a downstream um, signature, as you can see. So the wake is going to increase in its dimension, but also the velocity scale is going to change. So what I'm going to be doing is taking these power laws and allowing myself to parameterize the um, specifics about these island wakes that I see. 
So if this image, let's see if this plays really quick. Uh, so right now, what you're looking at is the image processing. So the synthetic aperture radar um, that you're looking at is a Sentinel-1 um, satellite, which this is going to be how my data is collected. Um, so it is just imaging the surface of the Earth by sending out a um, microwave pulse, um, which is sent to the Earth, and then the satellite um, waits for the return, and it takes in that, and it turns it into the raw data that you'll see pretty soon. So the image data. So here, the synthetic aperture radar imagery is really good because it's able to image both at nighttime and also through cloud coverage. So that's why it's a really good remote sensing imaging modality to study island wakes because, of course, if maybe you have a high wind or maybe specific place that you want to look at, and of course, optical imagery, if you're looking through satellites, just optical imagery is not going to be able to see through those clouds and really parameterize um, your island. So then um, what I will say is why synthetic aperture radar is great is because what we can do is we can take these um, backscatter values, which in this case are called sigma naught values, which they're calibrated a non-dimensionalist number that helps us to understand the relate to the wind speed. So this is an image that you just saw actually right back here. And what this is, is it's looking at the image and using an empirical function to relate the backscatter values to the wind. So not only are we able to see the um, width of the island wake, the, um, also we will know the wind speed. So why is machine learning approach great here? So Earth observation data is set meets deep learning. So in the terms of remote sensing, um, Earth observation data and deep learning is a relatively new thing because they're realizing that we can kind of take all of these algorithms that were developed and try to transfer them over to um, our remote sensing data. The only thing about remote sensing data is it's very particular in the fact of how it's not optical imagery. So as I, I took a quote exactly from this um, paper that was in IEEE's um, review, and they talked about how, of course, there's ImageNet, which is a well-known computer vision um, model and it was trained on optical imagery, which we can transfer those that knowledge and feature representation to remote sensing imagery. But the feature representations aren't going to match and align in the way that we need to. So when you're looking at transforming and using data science and deep learning approaches within my data sets, it's almost like it's its own new tasks. So what I'm trying to do is look at how the um, synthetic aperture radar, not so much we develop our own ImageNet data set because ImageNet is quite large in the millions and millions of images, but creating something that is a benchmark data set that we can use from SAR imagery to then go ahead and maybe down downscale tasks such as um, looking at island wakes in different um, regions or maybe transferring the image modalities um, if you're using one type of satellite to another in a sense of knowing that the deep learning model can develop that but based on our data. Um, so the good thing about um, remote sensing right now and synthetic aperture radar is it's gained a lot of attention because um, recently, the European Space Agency um, released Sentinel-1 data, which you can go online and actually download yourself right now, um, some of the images that I've worked with. Um, so it's great because a lot more people are getting into deep learning and remote sensing and being able to parameterize island wakes and these ocean phenomenon. But also, it's great because I'm working also with my advisor, and he's we're utilizing um, which I'll talk about in a second, his, um, at Sea Stars, he has a lot of access to more higher resolution images. Um, and then the last thing I'll kind of talk about is just in terms of my project, what I want to do is specifically segment the island wakes. So I've been researching what is the best segmentation architectures and what I've kind of come out with is UNET would be a good, you know, starting point, especially if I create a su uh, supervised learning pipeline to then get into. Um, so Sea Stars is what I was just previously discussing, is where my um, advisor is actually the director of, and he has access to higher resolution imagery, which eventually if I build this pipeline for my Sentinel-1 imagery, which is, is has a little bit, uh, it's around medium resolution imagery, then I can transfer that to maybe even higher, super higher resolution. Um, and then lastly, this is just kind of what I've kind of discussed, but in a 
<clears throat> general sense, my approach is going to be developing a custom island wake data set to make sure that I have the structure um, well established. Um, evaluate evaluating trade-offs between transfer learning and supervised learning, which I've already kind of understood transfer learning's good in a sense of optical, but maybe not the best for SAR. And then exploring model parameters, which a lot of papers with SAR data love to look at the max pooling layer, specifically because SAR da data has inherent um, speckle noise within it. And also looking at CNN layer depth. Um, and then integration of the imaging parameters. So synthetic aperture radar has these different imaging parameters such as polarization, incidence angles, and spatial resolution to maybe integrate that into my models. Um, and then lastly, exploring um, small data set techniques with different satellite sensors. So the satellite sensor I actually showed was not just one specific and that's how they're all designed. There's many different satellites, synthetic aperture radar satellites that have um, specific um, uh, different specifications. So looking at that. Um, and so overall my objectives are create the uh, data processing pipeline, extracting wake features, advancing parameterizations for the island wakes um, with classical power laws, and then using these resulting power laws as predictive capabilities of island wakes. So then you can transfer that into things such as forecasting modeling, especially looking at coastal uh, structures. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, the development of the database alone would be like a okay. of tremendous value. Yeah. <laughs> Our next speaker is Tianhao Lu. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, this oh, is sorry. not that. Extra slides, <laughs> just in case. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm. Hello, everyone. My name is Tianhao Liu, and I'm a um, biostatistics PhD student, and my advisor is uh, Dr. Daniel Diaz, and a uh, mentor from IDSC is uh, Dr. Como. And um, today's topic is about the uh, spectral gross theory methods using eigenpairs with small eigenvalues. So the motivation of the project is that uh, we know that the principal component analysis is widely used the learning tool. But usually people take the eigenpairs with the largest eigenvalues and uh, discard the uh, all rest. And my previous work instead make use of eigenpairs uh, with small eigenvalues for finding beta modes. The beta modes we mean here is the cluster of the points with a probability beta and the smallest the volume at the same time. So uh, also, we noticed that in the um, graph theory, the spectral of the Laplacian metric is utilized for clustering. And within this framework, the most significant element of the spectral are the eigenvectors corresponding to the smallest eigenvalues, uh, which are then employed as the features in the subsequent clustering origin. So we see there's kind of a uh, a connection here. Uh, also, same thing, a similar thing happened in the stochastic block model for community detection. And we see that at least in some cases, the small eigenvalues does matter. So it was better to export the application of a small eigenvalues components to random graphs and then networks. But we want to export the, data, the model and plan to analyze my findings in some large networks. And this is my candidate by now, the collaboration network of the archive astrophysics data set. And, and I will introduce a little bit about the stochastic blah model. The stochastic blah model is SBM is a probabilistic model and used primarily uh, for the analysis and the modeling of the network structures. See so here in this plot, they have a two cluster and uh, and they connect nodes connect with each other with different probabilities. And uh, the probability of forming an edge between any two nodes depends on the groups to which they, these nodes belong. This means that the likelihood of a connection is not uniform across the network, like the ordinary uh, Rini random graph. In, in that random graph, you, you put each edge uh, at the uh, same probability. So uh, 
the but this in in this random graph uh, model, the stochastic block model, and uh, probably very based on the group membership. Uh, see, so like uh, it, uh, between the uh, uh, different group of nodes, the probability of forming an edge is low and uh, yearly, and within the uh, uh, the group, the probability of forming an edge is uh, higher. So the question we uh, suppose is that mm, we want to know what role do the angle pairs with small angle values play in data science and machine learning in general, and uh, are there applications for these angle pairs in fields beyond mode detection, as my previous work then, and uh, clustering like the uh, random graph theory. Um, I hope. This project can give some insight into uh, at least part of the uh, um, the these two big questions, and this is the reference. Then thank you for listening. We'll keep it sh really short. Yeah. This concludes the presentation for the IDIS fellows. And now we can start with the uh, Provost Fellows. And our first presenter is Praga. My project is uh, focusing on analysis and uncertainty quantification on graph embedded time series data. I know that's a lot of mouthful, but let's break it down. So our group is more focused in terms of uh, conspiracy theories, in terms of uh, social media. So for example, if I send a tweet out saying today, uh, UM treats its PhD students very horribly, it's gonna blow up in the social media in a couple of days. So first question is how do we contain it? So in order to do that, we need to do a couple of steps. First of all, we need to identify there has been a conspiracy theory in the social medias. The second thing is we need to quantify it and uh, whatever the methodologies we develop needs to be in a scalable manner. So it work across, work, works across the entire social media itself and also quantify how confident we are in terms of such an uncertainty or a change of event. So this project focuses on uh, all of these three things. So starting things off, uh, some of the works which we have done is uh, already converting from time series into an undirected graph. So in this particular case, we would be trying to capture relationships between uh, degrees and also in nodes of influence in social media users, uh, specifically using directed graphs. So for this, we will be employing a normalized cross-correlation matrix. So previously in one of the works which we have done, uh, we used the, the normal correlation itself uh, and the paper is almost gonna be published too. So uh, the second thing is we need to account for non-stationarity. So in order to do that, so if we focus on the previous image, we break down the entire time series into smaller windows and we generate the graphs from the smaller windows itself. So because of this, we are indirectly handling the non-stationarity components of the time series as well. And also for high dimensionality, we'll be using uh, parallelization and we'll be also leveraging distributed computing. So each of the graph can be processed separately in like a distributed network or a network of clusters, if we can think about it. And uh, also in terms of uh, the anomaly detection, uh, we'll be converting one of our current works. So we use a autoencoder model, autoencoder neural network to detect anomalies in a ground subsidence data set, which we collected from the geology department. So we'll be using almost the same neural network, but we'll be uh, using the RKHS, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, to, um, so the data is initially mapped and the computational uh, complexity reduces down into big O of one uh, because of RKHS space and it's pretty faster too. So uh, this is the main part which we are currently focused on, so uncertainty quantification. So uncertainty quantification can be broken down into two parts. Uh, first thing is, are there any uncertainties in the data? And these uncertainties can be carried forward to the model itself, so uncertainty quantification in the model layers itself. So we'll be focusing on both the parts too. So in order to do this, we will be uh, borrowing some knowledge from quantum physics. So we'll be trying to solve Storinger's equation where the input for the equations would be our empirical PDFs. We would be getting from the data as well as the models, uh, the neural network uh, weight architectures too. 
So once we solve the Stodinger's equation, we should be able to uh, leverage perturbation theory and explore how a small perturbation or a small change in the data set itself would change the output drastically. So a quantification bridging both these gaps is what we are trying to aim at towards as an uncertainty quantification in this particular case. So, but still we are uh, in certain, we, we still have some open questions which we need to find answers to. Uh, so one thing is what's the ideal window length to generate the graphs so that all the local components or the temporary local sequences are carried forward rather than we are just simply capturing some noises and, uh, or if we choose it very large, then we account, the accounting for the non stationarity doesn't work very well. The second question we have is, this is a major question which we are working on day and night these days, even when I go to sleep, all I imagine is storing a equation in my dream. So uh, how do we develop the perturbation theory results with just one eigenstate? So quantification of the uncertainty itself by solving storing a equation is, uh, it's, it's gotta be the, it's the more mathematical part if I put it in a different way. And also the third one is uh, the relationship between the data level uncertainty and model uncertainty. I sort of feel like the once the uncertainty in the data, because we train on the data itself, it's gonna be carried forward into the model as well. So there should be a, a, a bridge between both these uncertainty quantification because we know the architecture and we know the hyperparameters which are used in the model itself. And also, um, uh, which summarizes in terms of like how we are gonna gatekeep the uncertainties which are gonna be spread in social medias. But since this is more theoretical, I believe the applications are pretty immense. So that's it from me. Thank you. Well, as a PhD, PhD student in atmospheric science, uh, and he will be talking about his work. I think I scrolled too yeah. much. 50 something. Here we go. That's you. All right. I like the photograph. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. That's me and uh, that was Pompeii. Um, I'm Will. I'm a third year PhD student at the Rosenstiel School in Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, my advisor is Shrama Jumdar, and my research broadly is focused on identifying these different disturbances in the atmosphere, specifically in the tropics, uh, using different deep learning techniques. So tropical waves, often the times are the precursors to hurricanes. Uh, the image on the bottom left is just a shot of two different tropical waves actually interacting. They're usually these clusters of clouds and uh, thunderstorms and some wind that sometimes serve as seedlings for stronger storms later on. Um, so these are important ingredients to hurricane formation. And there's a couple of different ways people have tried to track them. Um, and the National Hurricane Center actually, over that way in Miami, um, actually every day, every six hours, publishes the locations of all the different tropical waves that are in the Atlantic. Um, and they've archived these text-based discussions of these uh, atmospheric features for the past 20 years. Uh, they're in, you just have to search paragraphs and hopefully find some keywords. Uh, but it's a very nice archive um, that could be a very good training data set, turns out, for uh, trying to develop a machine learning uh, based model of uh, what a tropical wave is and identifying them and creating an even uh, longer data set. Um, so the two main goals in my research were to both uh, improve how the Hurricane Center operationally identifies uh, these disturbances, um, although that was kind of a, a secondary happy um, outcome of this. Uh, the main goal was to actually be able to extend the historical record back beyond the past 20 years to answer some broader questions about uh, how these disturbances behave. And luckily, uh, identifying disturbances in the atmosphere um, with structures like these, uh, like a lot of the field of machine learning, there's been plenty of uh, work on this problem in the past couple of years, but specifically for uh, like cold fronts and stuff in the atmosphere. So there is a body of work to draw from. Um, and so this is what I've been working on and pretty happy with the results so far. Um, the top image is just um, plots, little red and red lines and blue shadings are uh, locations of pr 
tropical waves predicted by the model and all the other uh, labeling of land and other contours is the Hurricane Center's actual like operational human done analysis. And generally they line up uh, pretty well and uh, I'm very happy with how it's turned out. And the Hurricane Center is also pretty happy. Uh, we also targeted the uh, intertropical convergence zone slash monsoon trough, another important weather feature in the tropics. Uh, and that's also worked out quite well so far. So happy with this, how this has been going. Um, the techniques we used here, um, Madeline showed the UNET architecture earlier. And so this is just UNET architecture. Uh, this is specifically a UNET uh, three plus that has some extra skip connections trying to uh, enhance the inherent goal of the unit, which is to extract course um, high level info about what objects are, if you're doing an image uh, segmentation tasks, what objects are present in your image and then use high, res high resolution info to determine precisely where those objects are located. Um, so that's the model framework we used um, to train. And the input data came from uh, this long, long archive called reanalysis of atmospheric conditions going back for uh, 40 years, except we can only use 20 years because we don't have labels for 40 years yet. Um, and we also use some satellite data um, like the, to see clouds like I showed earlier. Um, so as I hinted at, we read object labels straight from the text discussions, which was really kind of annoying. Took a, like two weeks to get all the different if statements set up uh, for different words to capture. Unfortunately, this was in like October, 2022. And if I waited like two months, suddenly there would have been plenty of large language models flying around that could do it uh, instantly. So, oh well. Um, but uh, another fun thing we did was to weight our training labels by how much they fulfill necessary, but not sufficient requirements to be a tropical wave or a similar disturbance. Uh, so that's just an example of trying to uh, recognize there are faults in our input data. They are human generated. Um, human input labels. Um, and so we did take steps to try and mitigate those. So happy with how this part of the project has turned out. Uh, now we're trying to pivot more towards being able to forecast uh, hurricane formation directly out of these or similar disturbances. Um, so we're trying to figure out right now if there's benefit to using some of these more complex architectures that have really taken off in the past couple of years, those being uh, vision transformers or uh, graph neural networks, which uh, both in the past year, there have been some seminal papers in uh, weather forecasting using purely data-driven um, models based on these architectures um, that for the first time with some caveats have matched our super computer dynamical physics-based models in predicting the weather. So exciting times in the weather world and machine learning. Um, so trying to uh, leverage similar uh, architectures and figure out how we can predict the formation of tropical storms uh, through predicting what disturbances like I've been looking at might become tropical cyclones, when they would specifically form down the road and also where uh, formation is actually going to occur. So those are actually three different separate uh, project targets there that will require different training, but that's where I'm uh, headed next. So thank you to my various collaborators at the NHC and also IDIS because training on my Laptop's annoying. <laughs> Nicholas. Nicholas. Uh, is it the computer science department? Mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Nicholas. I'm from the computer science department uh, under Professor Aguiar. And we try to improve the prediction of and diagnosis of cancer, especially breast cancer, from these pathological images. Why this? This is an example of a slice of a tumor that was extracted, and a doctor needs to go to that image, magnify it, and go almost cell, cell by cell to see if it's a malignant tumor and it needs more treatment, which kind of tumor and which kind of treatment it will be needed to do which is quite time consuming, exhausting, and it is it's easy to make mistakes when you are during two hours looking at cells. So machine learning can do this classification and it has great accuracy, over 98% in some models, but it only gives you yes, no, and it's not enough that for a treatment. 
I wouldn't want to go through chemotherapy because a machine tells me that I need to do it because yes. So we are trying to improve that explanation with the models, but it's not easy. Uh, in normal images, these kind of techniques uh, that are based in the gradient of the model work quite well. But when we apply them to uh, cancer images, they don't, don't even agree between themselves. So it's a bit complicated. We have been trained to improve this with pretreatment and improving the training of the models, the fine tuning. But now we are going and entering with the transformers because as it was mentioned before, it's the new way and it works completely different than the uh, methods before. The methods before we need to do uh, mathematical transformations and go backward to see. But the transformers have what it's called attention. Everything is about the attention. We can look at the attention of one of each of the layers of the model that gives us a similar result than the uh, run method before, or we can look at the individual heads in each layer. Each of the heads is going to look at something in the image, something different. For instance, there we can have heads like the ninth one that we don't know what it is, what it is looking at, but some of them are quite focused. In the fifth head, it's clearly looking at the bee. And in the third head, it's clearly looking at the flower. It's quite understandable for us. We are looking at how to implement this and uh, how to use it for the diagnosis. But we have problems with this because it was mentioned before too, transfer learning. We don't have enough data to train from scratch because it needs to be curated, uh, balanced, and we have uh, there are problems with uh, that the data is not public a lot of times. So we use transfer learning. Yeah, and one option would be print from scratch, but it's difficult. We can try to preprocess the data, or we can try to introduce domain knowledge into the training process. One of the ideas that we have is during the training process, look at an explanation of the that a doctor will give us over that image with what the explainable AI tell us and try to make it match during the training so that the result at the end will be more useful. Um, this is all. Thank you, everyone. Um, G1. Here we go. Okay. I'm Jiro Tian. I'm from the electrical engineering department. So my project is about the wireless uh, neural interfaces with uh, magnetoelectric uh, nanoparticles, uh, abbreviated as uh, MENPs. Uh, so the the total goal of, of this project is to to come up with the prototype of a high spatial and the temporal resolution. So uh, the motivation of the project is the, the currently uh, imagine the future. So like in a in a like sci-fi movies or in the cyberpunk settings, like human interact with machines without like with no keyboards and mouse, but directly do it with the brain. But the the catch is like a numerous attempts has been attempted. Uh, the most famous ones is Elon Musk and Neuralink, and uh, their approach like involves of like inserting like a micron diameters of needles into the brain with very high density, like a thousands of probe within a single brain, but nonetheless, this method is invasive. However, there are like uh, already existing like non-invasive uh, uh, methods like a EEG or like a MRI, like uh, people have all heard of it. They've been around for like, like dozens of years. And, uh, but the problem is with EEG, for example, you, you can't have that level of uh, high density. Uh, for example, even the high density ones in the EEG cab, you can have maybe 100 at maximum. Or for example, the MRI machine, like the the functional MRI, you can have uh, 
uh, the theory of around it is like you apply a gradient field and then you modulate it with a, with a uniform field and then you wait for the relaxation of, of the of the magnetic uh, uh, like materials in the brain wait for them to relax but this method has a long delay so people has demonstrated to control a machine with the functional MRI but the, the delay is in the second. For example, you give a command with your brain, and then after five seconds, the robotic arm can move. So that's a, like a major delay. So, so our method involves like a, the creation of a of a functional nano particle that you can inject and anchor into your, into your brain, and then uh, through the amplification of the nanoparticle, you can get the signal to achieve recording, or you can send the external field, apply a field to the same region to stimulate that area of the brain. So that's the overall uh, project, the uh, overall goal of the project. So there has been, uh, okay, the video played by itself, but uh, on the bottom left, you can see uh, the, 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 the neuro, this is an in vitro uh, experiment conducted. So, uh, like we apply the like a like a magnetic field externally around maybe one kilo gauss. So the the let me play it again. So the the cell can is like clearly indicated. It like lit up. You can see the dendrums and the network of the same. Let me go back to here. You can see it right. So the the the, the lines here got lit up. It, it's pretty clear on the on the video, so we already achieved the uh, the stimulation. And uh, uh, due to the small size of the nanoparticles, they can actually go through the blood brain barrier. For example, if you inhale some fragrance or something, it won't go through your brain. Or if you got uh, bitten, uh, like uh, with a dog infected by the rabies, right? If you get bitten with the neck and or if you got bitten by the feet, it takes a different times to reach your brain to infect your brain. So the barrier is, a, is like a major defense mechanism to stop from the like alien objects from entering your brain. But the nanoparticles, since it's the sub 40 uh, nanometer in size, it can actually go into your brain. And then you can apply some DC field to try to position and anchor the, the part particles in like uh, onto uh, a predetermined position. And then you can apply like a high intensity magnetic field to try to stim stimulate the brain, but within a tiny region. But the, the stimulation, uh, the catch is the simulation, uh, the stimulation must be applied within a tiny area to, to reach like a high degree of focality and such high spatial resolution can be achieved. So uh, here is the, the, the theory is that uh, with the theory of the, the meta stable physics, we can have a, like a two headed magnet. So the magnetization is like a transient process, right? So when you apply, uh, for example, when you have a coil surrounding an iron ferromagnetic core. So when you apply the moment you apply the current, so the the magnetization starts. It is the alignment of atom of the spin electrons. So it's not like a zero one process. It actually takes time. So the, uh, the atom gonna try to magnetize the neighboring atom. So by doing a, a, a dual headed magnet on the, the upper right uh, diagram, you can, uh, you can find the, the distance. Uh, of a negative 15 to 15 millimeter. So that is measured by the whole effect probe uh, shown in the, the insert here. And uh, when we apply, we tune the signal, like uh, so the, the two uh, coils are stimulated in different time instances. So we try to narrow these two sig signals to make sure that the two uh, the two magnetization overlapped. So the, the center, you can see that the, the shadow red region, we can reach a higher degree of focality just because we uh, apply the signal that is transiently like overlapped. So the, the, the higher focality can be reached uh, with this stimulation method. 
So this this really like it sounds very simple, but it requires a high degree of like tuning and lots of uh, trials and errors in the process to get this done. So we can achieve like a, a maximum fuel strength of. This is an outdated grab, but I think we can do more than one thousand Orsted fuel strength in the center now. So, but uh, since there's the 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 theory of uh, uh, reciprocity, so since we can st stimulate the brain, it's also like possible to record it back because the uh, when you sim simulate the brain with the magnetic field when. If you, uh, if you put a coil outside of the brain or very close to the proximity of, of the neuron, and if you attach the nanoparticles to it, when you are thinking something or the neuron fires for some signal, then elect electrical signal passes through the neuron, which uh, in reverse, it will actually uh, activate the, the nanoparticle, which in turn generate a magnetic field. So, uh, but this can is so in theory, this is totally achievable, theoretic, theoretically entirely possible. But the the catch is this is uh, disproportionately way more difficult than the stimulation to do because it's going to be buried in a sea of noise. So. Uh, for example, the, the nanoparticles, the field they produce is very, uh, is relatively low than an MRI machine or a, a, a coil. We can send any signal to amplify that field very easily, but to record is going to be the signal to noise ratio is going to be relatively much lower. So the, the only thing we can think of is trying to, to modulate the signal by giving it a Helmholtz coil setup. And we can try to detect the, the, the current changes by modulating with the function generator. But this is a very ambitious uh, project we're, we're trying to do because the simulation part, we're still trying to polish it, but this part is the major part because nobody has, has claimed they can manage to do it for the, uh, uh, for the time being. But uh, this is, once this recording functionality can be achieved, then it's like a major step forward uh, for the product. So uh, here are my references and thank you. Last but not least, Jamie, Jan. Also from ECE. So hello everyone, my name is Jimin Bian. I'm a PhD student from the ECE department. My advisor is Professor Jie Xu. I would like to introduce our project, which name as Federated Multimodal Learning with Modality Ketogenic in Computational Pathology. So recently progress in computational pathology has triggered a revolution in the medical diagnostic. The critical aspect of this progress involves utilizing the data from diverse resources. So for instance, as shown in the figure, you can see that research can combine the histology data such as the WSI, which is short for the whole slide image, with the genomic data like the combined number of variations which short for the CNV, to gain a comp comprehensive understanding of uh, um, classifying the um, cancer subtypes. So this multimodal approach has led to enhance the diagnostic accuracy. However, learning from such device data can meet the following problems. First, the data obtained by each hospital are quite limited which means the hospital need to cooperate with each other so they can build a reliable model. And then the hospital data are not like the public data. The data is highly privacy sensitive. So in other words, the hospital cannot share their data with each other directly. So the, for the last point, the, the modality is heterogeneous among the hospital. The modality heterogeneous arise from multiple factors. First, the equipment device uh, leading to a small range of uh, available data modality for diagnostic. Second, the patient, the patient selection for special hospital may result in some hospital has only limited uh, data available. So, and for the last 
for the last uh, for the last reason cause the problem is the data hold by different hospital maybe non id which is short for the non identical and independent distributed so how to solve such problem we know that federated learning can be a potential solution so what is federated learning federated learning like show in the figure, federated learning is a new kind of distributed machine learning, which was first introduced by Google in 2017. So in federated learning, each client, which is a hospital in our setting, uh, they hold their own data and do not transfer the data with each other. What they do is just communicate their trained local model with each other so they can cooperate to train a global model without sharing their local data. So now you can see the federated learning as a potential solution can solve the first problem and the second problem. But we found that the existing federated learning method focuses on homogeneous uh, modality settings, so they cannot work uh, smoothly in our setting. So to close this gap, this project we propose a new framework called the Federated Multimodal, which shows for the uh, FedMM framework. So unlike the traditional federated learning, which arm to train a single uni uniform model, in our framework, uh, the FedMM trains a multiple single modality feature extractor uh, cooperatively. So this allow each hospital to locally utilize the feature extractors to get some feature information and then they can use it for the uh, following classification task. So besides uh, as the federated feature extractor are trained using the distributed data, their capacity for generalization is significantly enhanced. For example, any hospital can benefit from this framework, no matter the device availability and the sample size. Uh, even the new established hospital, uh, which, which always has the limited uh, data sample and they do not have the enough device to have uh, multiple like the modality. So they can still use the trained, I mean the pre-trained federated uh, feature extractor to help their local model training and ensuring the data privacy because they do not need to share the uh, their local data. So for the last page, we show some current results and the future step for this project. We have done some experiments on the TCGA NSC LC data site. We compared our method with two baseline methods, including uh, like each hospital individually train their model and uh, the method like they, they just multiple average the local model directly. So for the future step, we're going to validate on more public data sites like the TCGA RCC data site. And uh, in our current framework, we can see that we, we only build an aggregation step for the feature extractor layer, but for the maybe for the next step, we want to develop the aggregation method for the classification layer. So that's all. Thank you so much. I think this concludes our the presentation section of the uh, of today's event. And I would like to kind of stress a little bit the breadth and depth of research being done here and how computing is central to all of this. Uh, uh, There'll be multiple other events where we will be able to meet and sort of share our progress and our findings. 